So we will now invite, go back to South Africa, fossils, and invite uh, Vincent Fernandez to come on to talk about uh, very large fossils. Thank you, Sophie. Um, hello, everyone. So I'm Vincent Fernandez. I've been spending quite some time at the ESRF. I actually, I've spent eight years working with Paul Taforo, if you have seen him this morning. So there was a lot of work that we've been doing together, trying to scan fossils. And um, in fact, uh, not that I was particularly looking for it, but my, uh, the history of scanning fossils was just brought me to scanning bigger and bigger things. And most of these things from South Africa. <laughs> So yeah, I've been doing my postdoc in the same institute as Lieberger, and I've developed a lot of collaboration, and it, uh, it, it just increased and increased and increased. So the three collaborators I've been uh, doing this project with are all uh, from this uh, institute, at uh, the Evolutionary Studies Institute in South Africa. So yes, we've been scanning a lot of fossils at the ESRF. And in fact, uh, it, they've been in for different uh, shapes and sizes, all sorts of animals, and with uh, different questions. But the, the question was, why, why do we come here? Why do we, it's quite unsettling at the beginning to see so many uh, uh, paleontological uh, projects in a synchrotron. So I thought I would e explain a little bit why we come here, not to uh, being too long, because Paul did that as well this morning. So there are a few param parameters of the synchrotron beam that makes it a bit different to come here, a lot different actually. There is the brilliance, there is the geometry of the beam, and there is the coherence. The brilliance means you have more photon, so you can go faster or you can have better results. It's like when you have more light, when you take a picture in broad daylight or at night. If you have more light coming in, it's, it's a lot easier to take a big, uh, more beautiful picture. Uh, the geometry, like in laboratory sources, you have a conical beam, so you have a distortion of your image, and you will see that there are some problems when you want to zoom in your object. And the coherence, it's for space contrast imaging that was covered by Paul, and I will show some other examples as well. So that's a um, relatively old slide uh, that, was the, that Paul was using to compare a laborat uh, laboratory macro uh, tomograph and a synchrotron. So which one is light? Yeah, so this is done with a laboratory source, and this is done on 1919. And you can see that the image is a lot clearer because you have more flux, you have more photon, so if you have a better image. And because we were able to use a monochromator as well, we get rid of beam hardening, the white rim that you see on that image. So the technology as well has evolved on, uh, on the laboratory sources. And so this is now that I work at the Natural History Museum and I have to work with a laboratory, so laboratory source, I can do some comparison between the more comparisons. Uh, not that we have to, but basically, if I have a comparison, it means it failed at the lab and we have to bring it to the synchrotron. So in this case, it was a tiny dinosaur from Wales. And you can see there is a mandible with the tiny teeth and some vertebrae here. So. Um, I did a relatively long scan, not the longest I could do, but in fact it didn't work very well. So, and just to show you that when I say we have more flux and it's faster, it's faster to get uh, with regard to one slice. So the beam in, uh, with the machine we have at the NHM is relatively large. We can image this whole thing in one go. It takes three hours, but uh, we can get all that. When we brought the same thing and do it uh, on BM5, the beam is really small. And so if we want to cover the same um, area, we need 50 scans. So even if one scan is a lot faster, in the end you need 20 hours to do the whole thing. So it's not necessarily a lot faster for a, a, a relatively big object. But when you look in 3D and you look at the result, spending a bit more time, so that's uh, on with the lab source and this is with the synchrotron. So the image is a lot sharper. You have you don't have this blurriness, you don't have this noise in the background. And here you can clearly see where the bone starts and when it ends. And if we go a bit further into the rock, uh, you can see the teeth. You, yeah, it's like the, it explains itself. It's a lot, it's a, the, the quality is a lot better uh, with the image done at the synchrotron. So more flux, better images, and even if it takes longer, definitely worthwhile. If we look on, this, on the other direction, yes, same story. Like here you can extract, virtually extract individual teeth if that's something you want to do. Here you can barely see what's going on. 
with the geometry of the beam, the part where uh, it's difficult to zoom in. So at the Natural History Museum, I was asked to uh, scan one of these Apiarnis eggs. So it's like there are really big eggs from this uh, extinct bird. And the problem is, because it's a conical beam, the, the magnification is done by changing the distance between the source and the, the between the sample, like moving the sample between the source and the detector. The closer you get to the source, the higher the magnification. A bit like with a torch lamp. If you put your hand really close, the projected shadow is really big. So here, if we want to see microstructure of the eggshell, we have to go as close as possible, but because of the size of the egg and because we don't want to break it, uh, that's basically where I had to stop. And I can only focus on the polar region of the egg. We had some information. We see a little bit what's going on, but clearly that's not enough if you want a true microstructure of the eggshell. So I didn't bring this one to the ESREF, but just to give you a feel of what you can do when you want to zoom in an object, well, I guess yeah, Dennis did that very well, as actually, when you want to zoom in really far. Uh, this is another example. This is a mammal-like reptile. And here we can see the, the, inc the incremental layers of the teeth at sub-micron resolution. So here, the, but the object is smaller, but you can really zoom in because the, the equipment is really far, so it's really not a problem at all. And the coherence, I think uh, a good example is the work I've been doing for my PhD uh, quite a few years ago now, but it, 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 shows very, it showcased very well why uh, the synchrotron is also really useful for fossil in general. So as uh, Paul explained, because of the properties of the beam, if you want to use phase contrast imaging and you only have to increase the distance between the detector and the sample. And if you look in detail and if you want to make some comparison, so this is, uh, oh yeah, I forgot that part. So the, my PhD was to study these tiny fossil eggs. So they don't look uh, really well preserved, but we knew that there were some tiny embryos inside. So they were, we were very excited about them. And we had no idea what they were. Well, we thought they were dinosaurs. But um, so when we scan this tiny egg on a lab source, well, it looks like this. It's not that bad. We can see that there are you know, something here, here, here. It's like the image is a bit noisy, but uh, it's like it's, uh, the I've seen worse scan, way worse. When we, you bring it to the synchrotron and you apply the same technique, absorption synchrotron microtomography, so you're close, you're the detector and the sample are really close, it's a lot better. It's a lot sharper uh, because of the flux, and you can recognize the structure a lot better. But it's not amazingly better. Increase the distance between the sample and the detector, and it looks like this. All these tiny things are bones that are completely invisible if you are based only with the absorption. And when you let the phase contrast kick in, then you see all these tiny bones everywhere. And then, then you have your magic happening. So. When you want to study a fossil eggs with embryos, you have uh, your recipe, your eggs à la synchrotronoise, if you will. You just scan your eggs. It takes 30 minutes. I think it took 12 hours, actually, back in the days. But now it will take just half an hour, maybe. Then you spend a few months segmenting every single bone one by one. So then you can do your 3D jigsaw puzzle. And then you reposition everything. And you can study your animal you can 3D print it, you can magnify it, and then you can study it as if it was a, a classic specimen. And we discovered that this animal was in fact a lizard and not a dinosaur as we thought it was in, at the beginning. But so scanning eggs gave a lot of ideas to a lot of people, uh, including some people in South Africa. So because they have this beautiful nest with dinosaur eggs, so they know there are dinosaur eggs b because they've prepared one of them, a uh, few of them actually. So it was discovered a while ago. And here the case is a little bit more difficult because it's bigger than the tiny eggs that was doing. And we can't, they are all in a tiny nest, so we can't extract just one and scan it. Uh, like the more you add material, the more difficult it gets to get a nice image. But still, so we, the idea was to s scan each egg one by one and then to focus on tiny parts. and you end up with relatively similar result quotes. So this is a very preliminary result of this study. Um, now the, the project have moved on. So you can do your spinning skull as well. It's pretty. But you can push the, so 
they knew what this dinosaur was. So that was not the point. We knew there was one. We knew it was a dinosaur. We know the species. So here the question is, what can we do with this data? And you can push the study a bit further. Forget about the spinning skull and compare with modern material of archosaurs and trying to get a feel for the incubation time. So if you compare with turtles, crocodiles, or chicken. So there is, it's not only just for um, uh, getting, trying to identify something. You can really push the study a bit further uh, with, with this kind of data. Put the bones back in their original position and compare the ossification pattern. And because it works, gives people ID, uh, like again, uh, the people from the, the ESI. And because you try something a little bit bigger, they, they push it. Like, can we do just a little bit bigger? It's like, yeah, probably. So they send a picture. We say uh, they wanted to scan this dinosaur, which is called Quabasaurus. And so you have part of the skull. It's a bit destroyed. And a vertebrae and a forelimb. And the idea is that we have this, all these bones, and we, we, don't really know, we, we don't really understand that well, that dinosaur. So it's a way of can we scan it, put the bones together, and finally get all the information that we need. And we did that in the course of uh, the ESRF summer school in 2016, so with Victor here. And we did that on ID16. So it was a very intense project because within a month we had to scan it, reconstruct the data, segment it, and present the <laughs> data at the end of the month. But yeah, Victor is a very diligent student and he managed to, to pull that up, so well done. And so what can you do when you have something like this? Is it starting? Yes, it is. So you can isolate a part of the skeleton and you can see the face that was hidden inside the rock. So now you have your bone in 3D, you can uh, you can un get all, uh, get, get have access to all the features. And so that was with a limb. Uh, well, we'll pass on the vertebra because we can look at the vertebra as well. But one of the region of interest <laughs> was the skull as well. So, bit, so it's all in different pieces. We wanted to do a higher resolution, of the uh, higher resolution scan of the skull. Problem is, uh, it's a big rock, uh, so it was not that easy to to, to focus in one go. But because we like challenge, uh, we decided to give it a go. So instead of scanning it vertically, this time we put it flat. Because it was prepared, in fact, there was not that much material where the skull was. And so if you look from the top, what we did actually is four scans that we ended up um, merging together. So it's like a scan is basically a cylinder. So here, instead of you doing your stacking, uh, like like just increasing the distance, doing more scan and stacking them. We did scan and moving the specimen horizontally, and we can just put them back together. Just took me like a month to <laughs> develop that, but <laughs> anyway, it's worth it because the data, uh, w you spend some time, but it's worth it because the data are really nice. And this is a first view of uh, the work of Victor, so he's spending a lot of time uh, segmenting each bone one by one, and uh, the we should see some um, more information about that in the future. So we don't have a lot yet on that project because Victor has been busy with something else. And so, we, yeah, we've, so we've scanned um, a lot of big samples, but mostly in the range of 15, 20 centimeter in diameter. And there are plenty of examples. There are uh, Australopithecus sediba. There is um, a burrow from South Africa as well, uh, like oh, a bigger dinosaur that was done uh, here as well. And one day, uh, Jonah contacted me because he wanted to scan a dinosaur called Heterodontosaurus. And so he sent me an email. We start discussing. Hey, I have this really cool specimen. It's nearly complete. It's articulated. And it's uh, heterodontosaurus. So I don't know every dinosaur because I'm not 10 years old. Even if I'm a paleontologist, I have to Google them. And I look at it, it's like it's 1.5, so it's like an animal that big. And it's like, it tells me, I think it would fit into the beam. He knows, the, he's been there a couple of times, so he knows that it, uh, what, what are the maximum thing. So if he's telling me that it's complete, articulated, and it fits, I was a bit curious. But so I say, yeah, if it, I believe him, but how large it is. So you say, ah, it's preserving five blocks, 30 centimeter 
long and 16 centimeters in width. Uh, I see the trick. It's not one big specimen, it's been cut somehow. And I would like to see a picture because it's always better to judge with a picture. And so he sent me this. And he said, OK, so each block one by one, so we do the math, we calculate everything. I say, yes, we can do that. It's going to take a week. But yeah. And so why is it like this? It's because it was found at the bottom of a riverbed, and there was a few bones sticking out. So the problem is when the water would return, it would damage the specimen. So we have to be excavated really fast. And in fact, paleontologists, they don't play much with brushes. When we have to do some work, we have to do it fast, and we use proper tools. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why the specimen was excavated like this. So in the end, we certainly missed a few parts where it was cut, but in fact, it was, it's in proper blocks. It was nicely prepared. They actually prepared the underside of the rock, so you can study it in both sides. And so of the sediment is really just a few millimeters thick uh, and uh, with a bigger frame of rock around. So we bring that to the ESRF. That's not how we scanned it this time. That's just for the nice picture of the media. Uh, <laughs> what we did was we thought about, so how do we scan that? First thing is we need several scans on the vertical axis with a 15% uh, overlap. I will come back to that later. Because it extends the, beam, the, the width of the beam on the horizontal axis, we, do, we shift the center of rotation on the side, so it doubles the field of view relatively easily. I say easily, I don't have to code the reconstruction algorithm. It's probably a nightmare. But, but for us, it's just moving the motor and done. And so we can fit the whole specimen in there. But the problem is the, s the, the aspect ratio of the specimen. So it's re really, li uh, really large, really long, and extremely thin. So we thought in to get more, f uh, to we can probably have more done. Um, we can do more. Uh, we can have better data, so if we spend more time, we can probably scan two blocks at a time, that's what I want to say. And we thought we should probably fill the gap a little bit with aluminum balls, uh, just because it, it's really, uh, the sediment is really too thin, so it will increase a little bit, it will be, the difference between the, the, the width and the thickness will be a bit less different, and so put the other block on the side, and put them together, and just put a lot of the tape everywhere, so it's not going to move for half a day or a day, uh, depending on how long it took to do that. And yeah, there was some dense inclusion, but uh, I will skip that. And this is not a fake media picture. This is the <laughs> real picture of us seeing the data for the first time after five days of experiment. So we are completely tired, but we were, they are all super excited. Jonah is like, whoa. And I'm like, <laughs> because in fact, when you look at the data a <laughs> bit closer, they look like this. So these ring artifacts are very nasty, and they're due to the fact that the specimen is really, really um, large. It's like, yeah, again, like probably 16, 18 centimeters. But it's enough so that when, you, when the beam goes this way, even if so you have uh, ring artifacts come from dust or impurities on your scintillator, the part that convert X-rays into visible light. So if you... When you do your tomography, you take an image without the specimen, and then you divide that with your radiograph. So it, you effectively remove all the defect of your scintillator. When you have something that large and that dense, the problem is you are not seeing the defect at all through the specimen. So when you correct it, you overcorrect it. You remove something that you don't see anymore in the real radiograph. And that's why it's a nightmare. And so that's what, why we use the 50% overlap in the end, because it means each part of the specimen was seen twice by different parts of the detector. And hopefully, if it was in a part with a nasty uh, defect or impurity or dust, there are some chances that maybe on the next scan it wasn't. So we could write a program that would select which part to take from the two scans, and hopefully that would solve the problem. Again, it was uh, quite a, some time to, it took quite a few months to, to write that, but it went to that. And this is not perfect, but this looks a lot better than uh, th this we can deal with. This we have classic ring artifact arrangement, and it brings to this. So, so Jonah and Victor, like for months, they've been so, are the data ready? Are the data ready? And it's, uh, it, was, it was a bit of a nightmare, but one day I was finally able to send them that. 
and we were able to apply that to all the data, send all the blocks, reconstruct this beautiful dinosaur, and put them back to their original position. So yeah, it was quite delightful to reach that step. And because there are dense inclusion, it was very easy to threshold the data, the inclusion that actually only where the bones are. And so what we, you see here is not really the bone, it's really just the dense inclusion that are surrounding the specimen. And now we have all the data ready. So Victor has spent some time uh, trying to segment each bone of this dinosaur. So he started in the rib cage because there is something funny going on. Um, we should see that published relatively soon. We, it was resubmitted uh, recently, so fingers crossed. And yeah, so it's, it's a lot of work. It's a big challenge, but in the end, it's worth it, and it's, uh, it's, it, it works. And then there were some other projects uh, where we kind of hit the limit, and I will finish on that. So, and it's kind of funny because it's one of the projects I did uh, so I was scanning like burrow cast. So when you have a burrow, the animal dig a tunnel. Um, in the fossil record, the, the tunnel is filled with sediment. So you have a cast of the tunnel in cell. And you can have some animals that have been trapped by the sediment that was filling the tunnel. And it's funny, on that day when I was scanning one of the biggest rocks that was scanned at the ESRF, uh, other people were scanning some of the tiniest stuff we can do on 1919. And it's actually, <laughs> it's the, the people, uh, so the, the, the team of, uh, Per Alberg, and they have been a lot better than me because they already published that. It's a beautiful study on tooth the origin of tooth replacement. I'm clearly not there yet because the data were really complicated. So first we had to ship the big burrow from South Africa. So they are about, yeah, that big. And we put it in a big barrel with um, pebbles to homogenize the attenuation. At least it was coming, it was broken, so I could scan it in two parts. Uh, we used the germanium detector, which doesn't have the best resolution, but that was the only option to scan something 30 centimeter large. And we had two blocks. So the part in green is the part that was missing. There was, I, I didn't saw that when I scanned this, but at least I have most of it uh, in there. And we did another test on the region of interest on 1919 at 24 micron. This is the result on ID17 with the germanium detector. So we knew that we, there was a few bones sticking out. And here we kind of see, indeed, there is something inside this big burrow. But <laughs> the quality was not there. We can't really work with that. But at least with this data, we were able to aim at a specific region of interest on ID19. Uh, much higher uh, energy polychromatic beam, 24 micron. Here we can see the bones. It's not the greatest image, but at least you can kind of work with that. There are even some parts where you see nothing at all. And if you look at the data from ID19, you can see like all these bone fragments. So I spent a bit of time trying to segment this data. They don't look really nice because uh, it's, it's a bit difficult and I have to go through all the slices manually. But at least I had some information. This is part of a mandible from a mammal forerunner. And at least I am 100% sure that they have no ticks. And there is a big group of these mammal forerunners with no teeth, so it's like narrowing the identification. And based on the age, the size of the animal, and all and all, we kind of we have a tentative identification that this animal is Odin alone. Because in the in the project of studying a burrow cast, the first thing you want to do is who was trapped in that burrow, and then move on with why was it in the burrow? Did he dig the burrow himself, and, and so on and so forth. So we are still. I would like to have better uh, um, information to be 100% sure that this is Odinodon. Uh, there is a lot of work to, to, get, uh, the, to, to go to the level of this, uh, um, this character, these diagnostic, this diagnostic characters, but uh, yeah, so it's, it's taking quite some time. So this is where we are, and um, hitting the limit of what can be done at the ESRF, and I was like, oh, what is the hope for the future? Well. Uh, the hope is probably uh, to have a beamline that allows to scan something like that decently. So with all the, the transformation the ESRF is going on, allowing some micron uh, on, larger on larger sample or imaging larger fossil, or at least because 
it, we kind of did it, but not it was not really possible to exploit the data. So maybe properly do things of that size. Uh, with the increase in coherence, being able to properly use phase contrast at higher energy as well, maybe that would solve the problem and see we can see the bone a lot better and help with the segmentation. And of course, the hierarchical imagining uh, access, because at the moment it was always the point of we have to dismount the optic or move the sample to another beam line. And if you see something in one image, you just, you just want to zoom in. <laughs> and you, we could not do that before. But because of that experience, there have been a, a lot of, in, of development in that aspect as well. And it should be a lot easier to reach, uh, to do a, a relative large scale scan and then zoom in region of interest. And on that note, I will conclude my presentation. Thank you, everyone, for your attention. Thank you, uh, the organizing committee, for inviting me. And yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Vincent. That was really interesting. Any question to Vincent? No question? Yeah? Thank you, Vincent, for a very nice talk. Um, mm -hmm. Can you say something about uh, data analysis? Because it looks to me that uh, you know, with all this uh, you know, data and the features and, and so on, probably data analysis is uh, going to become a major uh, bottleneck in order to have uh, an efficient use of this data. Yes. Uh, it's also true, you, we wait so many years uh, to have the data, we can probably wait uh, many other years uh, to fully analyze them. But, uh, you know, uh, uh, humans are quite uh, anxious uh, to get everything done very quickly mm -hmm. if they can. Mm. Yes, it's true. Uh, so getting something scanned is not really the bottleneck anymore. And um, if you look at all these projects, so the dinosaur egg, the lizard eggs from my PhD, I was a PhD student, uh, Kim and Victor, they were, uh, they've been doing this work with their masters and their PhD. So it's People who do this kind of work is people, they have 100% of their time, almost 100% of their time dedicated to this kind of work. Because it takes literally weeks and weeks and months to do uh, this kind of um, segmentation. Um, we, the, the, what, what we are hoping is a uh, jump in probably in uh, machine learning to, to get s more automated segmentation, so even if it would take days for the machine to work out the data by itself, if you don't have to spend your day yourself uh, doing it manuala, manually, it, it would help tremendously for sure. I, I guess one of the difficulties that every fossil is different, so it's like the texture, the, the, the contrast is different, but people are working on it, so, and it's been very promising in other fields, so why not for us indeed? There is indeed in the program a session tomorrow afternoon about uh, deep learning, machine learning. Thank you. Any other question? Maybe, Sophie, if I can ask something? Yeah, absolutely. More, uh, more as a chemist. Uh, for one example, you were mentioning uh, den dense inclusions. Mm -hmm. And can you just give me, I mean, what does it mean and in terms of composition? Is it? Is there a strong difference and what is it made of? Um. And to which extent somehow getting probing more the chemical composition rather than just the density, could which additional information you could get um, from the chemistry? So, so we have, it's because I, yeah, I don't think I have, a, well, I think we do, uh, if we come back, well, actually this one works. I mean, so, like the, so here you have your bone, and it's very similar in density to the matrix, like what we see here. We see the, the vascularization of the bone. And the white part is a dense inclusion. In that case, I have no idea what it is. Um, uh, a lot of people would say it could be hematite or it could be pyrite. It's very common in fossil to have this mineral. But it's not always studied. Um, we, d we don't really look at what it is at the moment. Which, in some cases, could be a shame because these are inside the bone. They are inside the vascularization, so they could mean something in terms of biology. They, can, they are certainly here because of the biological material that was here first. So they might contain some information, but it's something that was not very explored. But at the moment, reforest has been a hindrance for 
uh, getting nice data, but I know I know in South Africa they did a few tests on Heterodontosaurus, and apparently it was hematite. But beyond that, beyond what does it mean? What 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 does it mean in terms of preservation? It's we. I'm not sure there was a lot of work that was done on that. But this is maybe something which will come more in the future that our two communities, the natural heritage, the cultural heritage, will meet maybe more mm -hmm. with uh, combining more chemistry and imaging uh, and, and merging these two approaches to, to learn more about uh, this kind of materials. Yeah. Thank you. Y yeah. Go. Just to say that it's, it's worth noting in Per Alberg, Uppsala, that although you know you might look at it and think, well, well this is an inconvenience, actually, because the, because the synchrotron actually copes with inclusions like this, it, it, if you put this into a conventional X-ray source, you'll get awful kind of uh, sunburst lines there, and it just messes everything up. But we have a couple of specimens we're working on at the moment from the Devonian of Russia, early tetrapod material, where in file, or, you know, whether it's hematite or pyrite or whatever, but extremely bright material that is investing and filling the spaces of the bones is fantastically helpful because we get extremely good contrast between the bone and matrix and you're able to model up very, very cleanly the surfaces of the bone. Areas where the bone is in direct contact with, as it were, normal matrix, much more difficult to work with. So, you know, with the quality of, of equipment we have here, then, you know, this stuff isn't necessarily a problem at all, but can be a real help. Yes, uh, and well, in, that, in that particular case, it helped because that's the only thing we could see on the first scan. And it's true as well for Heterodontosaurus, where like, we can see almost the full skeleton with just a threshold. So it's not the entire bone, but at least we know uh, it, it's a start for the segmentation, maybe. So yeah, it depends on the cases. Sometimes sometime it's been completely impossible to work with, but some other time it's been indeed quite helpful. <coughs> Thank you, Vincent. Any other question? Then, if I, yeah. if I may ask a second one yeah. then. Uh, and a bit related to what Francesco asked about data analysis and so on. There was one picture where, I mean, y y we were with you at the beam line and we were getting results with you. And I was wondering to which extent, I mean, how, to which extent when data are acquired, you have already some results because you were mentioning that data processing is taking uh, a lot of time. And with this idea of zooming in, you need to know, you need to have a feedback. So mm -hmm. is it because when you zoom in, you don't need this segmentation, you can immediately recognize or, I mean, or, or you, you need to also to increase the speed of data processing in this strategy of, uh, of uh, well, hierarchical approach? Like if we look at the, so it depends how bad it is. Uh, so d for, like here we did hundreds of scans to cover the whole blocks of this dinosaur. And when we look at the first data, they look like this, which is not something we can really work with, but we can see what's going on. We can see where, uh, we can see the bones. Uh, so f f typically from this, it's enough to know if you want to zoom yes. in this particular region, it's enough. You, you okay. Mm -hmm. And at least we know as well that this can be taken care of later so it's it's not r like we can recognize when something is uh, uh, like is a problem that can be solved or not uh, but at least yeah it, this we can obtain relatively quickly after uh, when we do a full scan uh, which so a complete scan takes 20 minutes um, and to get the result it probably like depending on the cluster it would maybe in an hour you can have something or maybe less uh, you can have one slice very quickly in a couple of minutes so, but if you want a larger volume, it takes, it takes a bit more time, but I it's relatively quick to have something of that quality. It's just like, uh, yeah, the difference between what you can work with and uh, just having a quick idea of what the data look like. But yeah, we need the, the, uh, a fast response indeed uh, for when the scan is finished to, to, to be able to get an image. And so far the workaround was to get really small scan, so they would be s relatively fast to process in just a couple of minutes, and, and then we would know uh, either to run a full resolution scan or if we had to move the specimen. It's been the, the strategy as well, like when we have to scan, to aim for something that is in the middle of the rock and it's really small, so we pre-center with what we know and then we do quick scan, it's like if we see the specimen on the right, then we move it again, scan it again, like in just a couple, like five minutes maybe, and we keep on 
doing like very quick scan and quick reconstruction and moving on, which in the end is very time consuming because you can spend like two hours just centering one specimen, but uh, uh, never, yeah, of course, yeah, it would be better if it would be faster, but <laughs> it's so far it's been working relatively okay. But yeah, it's like uh, just uh, the time to see if it works is always uh, 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 a bit frustrating. So it, de it depends of the the the, yeah, the 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 quality of the quick scan or the. <laughs> yeah, it, uh, sorry if I may fill in. It, it depends on your research question as well, because a reconstructed slice is a is a two D part yes. of a three D thing. So if your question is, I want to find a growth line and you have oriented your sample uh, correctly or the way you want it, then you can see on a first reconstructed slice, you can see this growth line uh, and the vascular canals that I show. But if you want to know the three-dimensional distribution, then you need to segment them out in order to visualize mm -hmm. them. So that can take a, a bit longer sometimes. Yeah. I, I would like to sum up everything that was said in the paleontological session, because we have still a bit of time, like 20 minutes. So we achieved like very exciting results, it seems, on very iconic uh, taxa and uh, fossils. But it seems that we are still going through some difficulties and that the improvement and the, uh, the appearance, like the creation of a new beamline, BM18, will be uh, very exciting in this field. And I think that that would be nice if we, we could have like a small discussion on this aspect. For example, if I invite Lee, Denis and Vincent to tell us exactly like the limitation and what they would expect from their fossils or from their data. And Paul, maybe if you don't mind to answer like what the beam line could maybe help us to achieve with that, that would be really nice. I think that one of the things that comes up here that we're all poignantly aware of is the human cost that's going to come with this increased data. And I'd like to touch on that just a little bit more. The, I don't think it's a viable future to think that we can take young people and have months and months and months doing reconstructions of these. You saw that, I mean, the scale of the data sets that I'm proposing are larger than anything that you were seeing there, and you see the investment that has to go in that. And so I think that the collaborative investment in machine learning, artificial intelligence, that can actually at least bring that project closer to um, uh, usable data based on densities, based on the uh, geochemistry and other aspects of this have got to be the future that we have to invest heavily in because I suspect, and Paul can correct me, but the, while the data quality goes up, the data size and the data complexity goes up and, you know, spending the helpful lives of masters and PhD students is, is one, one thing, but we have to move to an, a, a place where the machines are taking that away from us. Um, so about machine learning, it's clear that it is one of the directions where we start to go, and in fact, we already made tests also. Not, uh, we just made one test on a fossil so far that was an Alscaraptor, a small dinosaur that we scanned uh, two years ago. And to be honest, I gave the data to my daughter that is 11 years old uh, with remote connection to the computer from home to the SRF, she was drawing on the screen for fun during one hour to, to say where the bones are and so on. Then I trained the, the computer with that, and the day after I had the better segmentation than what we made with four scientists in six months. <laughs> so I think clearly machine learning and deep learning is the way to go for the segmentation. It will not solve all the problem because it works if the data are very good. If you have crappy data with a lot of artifacts and so on, you can train as much as you want, you will segment artifacts. So the quality of the data is always the start. So that's why we are pushing like, uh, we make this project with BM18 and so on. The thing is, the first key is to make sure that you have the best possible quality and then you can apply all these new technologies for machine learning and so on to really push uh, to go faster, to be better for segmentation and so on. So it's, you have to see that as a continuum in, in many things. You need all the parts of the chain to be able to reach uh, the result. So um, Sophie was asking a, a bit about the capacities for the BM18. So I will show uh, some more details on Friday. But to, to do that very rapidly, the maximum size we had before was 50 centimeters by 16. 
With BM18, it will be 2.5 meters vertically, 1 meter horizontally, 300 kilograms, and able to cover without having to dismount anything. So you have all the, the detector can change themselves. The beam line can tune itself. Uh, so you do not need to dismount the sample and so on. You can cover from 200 microns for full scan to 0 0.7 microns for spots. And all that, you have continuous uh, pixel size from 1 micron to 27. Then you have uh, uh, 50 microns, 100 microns, and we are planning a kind of super resolution detector that can cover the full field of view at 25 microns. But don't dream too much about something like that. It means one petabyte of data per day. <laughs> so that's why we need the machine learning. It is a problem when you push on so many things and you make the beamline more automatic, you make more data, faster, better, but it means also that you will work on more difficult case. So at the end, even each time you gain on the technic technical thing, it does not mean that life will be easier. It just means that you will do things that are more difficult. So at the end, we will continue to develop. I mean, it's the only way to go. Thank you very much. I have a question because you say so you will probably produce like beta of uh, yeah, data. No, maybe not always, but quite a lot. So. Do we have like all the processing that will follow all the servers and everything at the server? No, okay. We have part of it, it's uh, one part of the big development uh, within the EBS. So there are completely new clusters. They are uh, supercomputers based on GPU calculation and so on. And uh, there are many people working on the automatic workflow for the, the tomography to make sure that first, very rapidly during the experiment, we have a feedback uh, on what we are doing. So not only seeing one slice per scan, but seeing the complete scan very rapidly in a way that you can really select for the next one without having to dismount anything. Uh, but then when you want to go to the full quality, in this case, you need the full power for the calculation. So it's really huge infrastructure and uh, we need a lot of developments in the software aspects. So all that is ongoing, but I would say when you start to make the math for the amount of, uh, of data, you also hit another problem that is data storage. I mean, being able to process rapidly is one thing, being able to, to store all that is another problem and it's a huge one. So one of the direction we took, uh, I think three years ago, is to use in an early systematic way data compression. So it's a kind of uh, against the religion in tomography. Normally when you do tomography with synchrotron, you do not want to do any destructive compression because you want to keep everything in fact, after some time, you have to do it. So, and I would say many people were afraid of that, but we, we moved to JPEG 2000 formats that can gain a factor 10 in terms of uh, volume. And when you quantify the error, it's less than the natural noise of your detector. So it means you do not see it at all. So it's also part of the thing. To be able to deal with all that, you need also to play with compression and so on. Just one quick comment was that uh, just to give all of you hope, 11 years ago when we did the Sediba skull, it produced this astronomical data set of 15 terabytes um, that we, the total data was, we had three five terabyte drives, right? Yeah. yeah, with the raw data. Yeah. That's right. And so, and that just seemed so off the charts at that time, you know, and now your iPhone can sort of deal with that. So, our, a little bit more than that, but but it would a good iPhone could do it. <laughs> but that you know we are catching up with that, so I don't think we should be afraid of the production of data, even if we do have to wait. But it'd be better to solve it now. Uh, yeah, if you scan an Archaeopteryx, they're typically quite dinosaurs in large limestone slabs. So this hierarchical aspect that you can zoom in is very important because if you look at the anatomy of the animal, how the bones stick together, and then you want to look at microanatomy, what does the bone itself look like? and then microstructure, you need to zoom in on a specific place again. Uh, when we were doing the experiments, we were very careful, but sometimes we needed to remount the Archaeopteryx over and over again to get just the field, uh, in the field of view that we were interested in. If you have an automated setup that allows you to switch resolutions on the fly, you do not need to handle the specimen as much, uh, which uh, makes it easier, life easier for you. You can even automate chain scans overnight when you're not there or remotely controlling it. And that will help a lot. And also the fact that you know exactly which part you are scanning in each of the scans. So you don't need to manually superimpose these parts, but you can have uh, a view in which you have the overview, clearly zoom in on this part, have the bone itself, and then have the microstructure. And this is something that Vincent also touches on, because if you want to have this coherence, if you want to understand it all the way through, 
You can identify a feature in your larger scan and then zoom in on it without having to manipulate the specimen itself. Yeah, and it has a second effect that is very important in terms of algorithmic reconstruction. As all the scales of the different scans are within a single 3D referential, it means that you can use the data from the low resolution scan to improve the quality of reconstruction for the high resolution one. And it's very important for local tomography, for instance, when you are scanning a very small volume in a large object. So we are able to do it now, but with a lot of artifacts due to this local tomography geography, uh, geometry. As soon as you go with real multi-resolution, you can correct for all these effects. So it's uh, also, it's not on only more convenient, it's also a way to have much better data. I have another question because, and it's related to Dennis, what Denis presented, because he works he, on Archaeopteryx, which is a flat bone, a uh, flat, fo uh, sorry, fossil on the slab. So do you think that BM18 could also like improve, because I know that you have some artifacts working with flat uh, fossils, could BM18 be a, a solution as well? Let's say it will not be the absolute solution because uh, when you are dealing with flat objects, you have missing data, whatever you do. So BM18 will be able to reach higher energy, meaning that you can go through more material. So you will have less missing angle, but you will still miss data. Um, but also you will have better coherence, so better phase contrast. So you are still missing part, but finally what you miss is, is less than before. So the data will be better, but still will not be perfect along the axis of the plate. Uh, but we can also think with some uh, workaround solution, and especially combining the tomography with other techniques such as scattering tomography, so we made some tests some years ago, that can give you a bit of information for the third dimension, or even something much simpler that would be a surface scan in the same time, that give you the external shape, because if you can give to the reconstruction algorithm the external shape, you can correct for most of the artifacts that are linked to the, the missing angle. So many, many things will come from algorithmic processing, but as I said, it works only if you have good data from the beginning. Thank you very much. Yes? Yeah. You have a question? Yeah. <coughs> Maybe it's, um, again, I, the, the X-ray scientist coming in, uh, um, the more you go up in energy, the more Compton you're going to have, where uh, basically, uh, you know, uh, the, all the coherence is coming from Rayleigh scattering. And uh, in the moment in which you increase the Compton uh, contribution, uh, that will uh, basically gives you background and, and so on. Would that be a limiting factor at some point? Or have you seen anything in this direction? Or do you will need to have some kind of filtering in order to get rid of all the low energy X-rays that are coming out of your? Uh yeah. In fact. Uh easiest way to deal with that is uh, the size of BM18. When we will be at the highest uh, energy, we will be with a detector 40 meters from the sample. And the scattering is going in nearly every direction. So just by the distance, you reduce a lot the scattering. And if it's not sufficient, there are also algorithmic corrections. So basically, you do the first scan of your sample, then you do a second scan where you have uh, absorbing mask on the front of the detector, and like that, you can make uh, um, a low, low frequency reconstruction of the scattering contribution and remove it from the data. So yes, we have solutions, but in most of the cases, and it's what we already saw on ID19, just increasing the distance, first you have the phase contrast, that is what you want, and also you reduce the problem of scattering. Yes. 